You see, there, there are five types of content in the human mind. Data, information, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It's a hierarchy. There's an old academic aphorism which says an ounce of information is worth a pound of data. <laughs> an ounce of knowledge is worth a pound of information. An ounce of understanding is worth a pound of knowledge. An ounce of wisdom is worth a pound of understanding. That makes an ounce of wisdom about 42,000 ounces of data, you see. The point is that uh, data, information, knowledge, and understanding are all concerned with increasing our efficiency. How can we more effectively get what we want? Wisdom is concerned with effectiveness. And it's only fairly recently we've come to understand the difference between them. We used to use them synonymously. The best distinction I'm aware of is one that was made by Peter Drucker when he said there's a difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. Hmm. See, doing the right thing is wisdom, effectiveness. Doing things right is efficiency. Now, the curious thing is the righter you do the wrong thing, the wronger you become. If you're doing the wrong thing and you make a mistake and correct it, you become wronger. Hmm. So it's better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. See? So we're now questioning. It turns out that almost every major social problem confronting us today is a consequence of trying to do the wrong things right. So instead of looking at the efficiency with which we're pursuing our objectives, we're beginning to re-examine the objectives. Would you like an example? Oh, I, I'm mesmerized. Go right ahead. Well, take the health care system. As you know, it's been deteriorating terribly. We're the only developed country in the world that doesn't have universal coverage. We've got 42 million people uncovered. We are not the best health care system in the world, despite the politicians. According to the World Health Organization, we rank 37th, not number one. Furthermore, we spend three times as much per capita, even though we don't cover everybody, as number one. But something is fundamentally wrong. And what's wrong is we never had a health care system. That's a misnomer. What do you pay a doctor or a hospital for? We're taking care of you when you're sick or disabled. It's a disability and sickness care system, not a health care system. Somebody said, aren't they the same thing? Well, of course not. What's the worst thing that can happen to somebody who depends on his income on the treatment of sickness and disability? See, if everybody were healthy, we'd destroy the system. That can't be a health care system. If we wanted a health care system, you would have to pay a doctor for keeping you healthy. You would pay him a fee, and he would then pay all your medical expenses. Now, it's in his interest to keep you healthy, not to keep you sick. There was a recent study done by the federal government which showed that over a million people a year are seriously infected while in the hospital, and over 100,000 of them die. There's a lot of surgery that's unnecessary, we know that, and testing is just abominable, you know, use of MRI and other stuff. It's all because the system is trying to survive by maintaining sickness and disability. And it does. So this is an example that you're giving as to our change in inquiry. We're going to look at a different objective in healthcare. We begin to look at what is actually the objective as opposed to what is proclaimed. The difference between what's practiced and what's preached. For example, another example, education, which is deteriorating. We're the only country in the world with increasing illiteracy. Uh, our performance compared to other countries is terrible. And the reason is that our system is not about learning, which is what education is supposed to be about. It's about teaching. And we don't recognize that teaching is a major obstruction to learning. You learn your first language, nobody taught it to you. But whoever learned the second language in school as well as they know their first language? You don't. It's estimated that 95% of what you use in your everyday work as an adult, you learned at work, not in school. Most of that is, it turns out to be a waste. But those who have taught learn something very fundamental. Who in a classroom learns the most? The teacher. See, schools are upside down. The way students should learn is by teaching others, not by being taught. Now, there are schools which have been designed that way, and they're remarkable. 
The faculty are now a resource available to the students who have to teach other students, and they learn by teaching, not by being taught. It's an entirely different concept of education. And you can take each system, you know, your health, welfare, and so on, and you find out that they're, they're all pursuing objectives which are contrary to their intention. So it's not a matter of efficiency, it's a matter of effectiveness. I wasn't planning on asking a philosophical question, but given the power of your first answer, I need to ask you this question. Since you have this wisdom and this insight that strikes me as quite powerful, what is the reason that it isn't the predominant force, or will this kind of thinking be the predominant force? That's a very good question. Uh, it goes back to something very simple, it becomes complex quickly. You never learn by doing something right, because you're already doing it right. You only learn from mistakes, okay? Now there are two kinds of mistakes. One is when you do something you shouldn't have done. A company bought another company it shouldn't have bought. Eastman Kodak bought Sterling Drug, it turned out to be a serious mistake and they had to get rid of it, for example. That's called an error of commission. This other type of error is when you didn't do something you should have done. Eastman Kodak didn't buy Xerox when they could have. That would turn out to be a serious mistake. Now it turns out that errors of omission are much more important than errors of commission. If you look at companies, organizations, and countries that fail, it's because of what they didn't do, not because of what they did. But now, if you look at the accounting system we use, public and private, they only record the cost of errors of commission. When you don't do something, it never appears in the books. So if you try to find out what it cost Eastman Kodak not to buy Xerox, you can't find out. If you want to find out how much it cost them to buy Sterling Drug, which they bought, you can, you can find out. All right, now you're in an organization that says making a mistake is a bad thing and you're a manager. So you want to keep your job and maintain stability. You don't want to make a mistake. But what kind of mistake? The only kind they record. Doing something you shouldn't have done. Now how do you minimize the chance of doing something you shouldn't have done? By doing nothing. You got it. That's the answer to your question. It's our treatment of error that leads to a stability which prevents significant change. We have to start to recognize the importance of errors of omission, record and correct those errors when they're made, and that requires a whole new way of thinking. Let's look at some omissions. I think that's a good place. I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to stay on the outline of restructuring the corporation. We can come back to that, recreating the corporation. I'd like to find out what grand omissions. You've mentioned education, we've discussed health care. Let's go deeper into some omissions that you see. Well, you can do it either at the corporate or at the national level. At the national level, um, the principal thing we're not doing is facing the central problem confronting the world, which is the maldistribution of wealth, standard of living, and quality of life. And we don't, we're not facing that problem. And the failure to face that problem produces the unrest as one of the central causes of the mess we're in today. Uh, we consume such a huge portion of the total resources of the world and redistribute only a very small portion of it. So when we're seen outside as avaricious and miserly and so on, all of which is so. Uh, we have a wonderful life, but at the cost of others. A doctor called me yesterday, a friend of mine from Washington, and he was very upset. He said that we have now reached four deaths in anthrax, 14 known cases. He said, you know there were over 10,000 children that died this morning of starvation. How come that's not in the papers? See? Omission. It's an imbalance. Now, that does mean anthrax isn't a problem. Of course it's a problem. But in a sense, it's trivial compared to the problem of starvation and lack of food around the world. We're not doing very much about that.